All right, thanks for coming to this afternoon session. Um, uh, today we have Chris to come talk to us about HTTP by the numbers, um, and it will be followed by another local Tasmanian, uh, Scott, afterwards as well. Uh, so Christopher is a programmer who lives in the Tasmanian city of Hobart, where we are now. He currently works as an Android developer, which means his day job involves more Java than he would like. He is strongly interested in developing the Australian and international Python communities. He is a director of LCA 2017, a past convener of PyCon Australia, a board member of Linux Australia, and has been a fellow of the Python Software Foundation since 2013. In his spare time, he enjoys uh, presenting on mobile development at open source conferences and presenting on open source development at mobile conferences. So firstly, thank you, Chris, for all your work in the community. You've done thank a great you. job. I look forward to more. And yes, welcome. Enjoy your talk. Oh, oh th thank you, everybody, for the, uh, for the welcome. Um, my name is Christopher Neugebauer. I'm, uh, as Peter said, a, a local from here. Uh, and in a, uh, a, a recent past life, I've worked as, uh, as a mobile developer uh, with, and have, um, in the projects I've been involved with, uh, certainly in the past, um, yelled at people about their abuse of, uh, of networking in their, their mobile projects. Um, so I'm a developer, and this is a talk that's aimed at people who develop applications, um, be it things that are served through a browser, which is what most people do HTTP with, uh, or for people who make um, client applications that talk to web services. If you're a networking person, uh, you're probably likely to find a lot of this uh, material quite uh, facile, boring, um, uninteresting, obvious. Um, if it's wrong, uh, let me know, but after the talk. Um, so app developers tend not to care too much about what their network does, provided uh, the stuff that they mean to send gets received by the server they're sending it to, uh, and the stuff that you get from the server comes back to you in a mostly intact fashion. Um, and so to, to people who are developing apps, um, basically, it should never be a thing that you care about. Your network protocol should be a completely boring subject to you and something you completely ignore. Um, this is because people who are smarter than you have already figured out how to solve problems of reliably sending things down a wire. Um, I have a couple of friends on the HTTP working group and they've convinced me that they know more than me about this. Um, it's only taken, it only took them a, a few minutes to do that. Um, so, you know, if I don't need to worry, you probably shouldn't need to worry about it too much. So this talk is about HTTP. So why do we care about HTTP in particular? So firstly, HTTP is the world's primary vector for sending cat photos. Um, it is what makes the web work. Uh, as also the basis for most network APIs for things, for where your apps go and request things from a service. And, and get stuff sent down to you. Mobile apps talk to HTTP to get stuff from the service they talk to, regardless of whether or not they're serving up web content or not. And um, as we learned yesterday in Katie's talk, the web has a history of rewarding fundamentally bad technology, um, provided it's good enough at the time it's adopted. Um, HTTP is interesting because it's evolved to suit the needs of what people are doing with it. And it's interesting to look at it from that perspective and the reason why we should be doing it this year is because interesting things are happening in the world of HTTP for the first time in several years. The first is that Apple are doing interesting things uh, regarding blocking of uh, non-secure HTTP on apps for iOS and for Mac OS X. And the other one is that the IETF HTTP working group has finally come back and standardized um, a new version of HTTP. So that makes now a really good time to go and look at how this stuff works. So the aim of this talk is basically to give you a better idea about what your apps that talk to the web are doing when they're on the wire. Um, knowing what your code does when it's using the network means that you can make things work faster, work better. So let's start with some basics. Um, Fundamentally, HTTP is made up of a request response cycle. So that means you send, you get stuff to, uh, sent to you basically by asking a server for it. And every time that you ask for something, you will get sent one thing back by your, by your server. 
And secondly, HTTP itself is stateless, which means that you need to provide enough information to it in every request for the application on the server to identify you, uh, what sessions are related to your request, stuff like that. Uh, this contrasts with things like FTP, where, for example, um, if you change the directory your FTP session is in, the connection remains aware of what directory you're in, transmission preferences, you've changed your settings and stuff like that. So this talk is primarily about uh, network performance. So let's talk a bit about what you might want to measure when you're, you're making a, a network-based application. So if you're not thinking too hard about this, you might be thinking about throughput. So throughput is the amount of stuff you can receive from a server, the amount of stuff you can send up to a server. Um, this is really only interesting as a theoretical maximum for a given scenario. It's not particularly interesting to you as a developer because generally throughput is not a thing you can control. Um, you can only try to do better out of the, the throughput that you have when you're developing stuff. Um, here at REST Point, I was able to pull down about four megabits uh, off the public Wi-Fi by uh, speedtest.net. So the other thing that we're interested about and we can do more stuff about is latency. Um, latency is how quickly you can observe that a network transmission has taken effect. So as developers, the latency we care about is how long it takes to get data back after we fire a request off. Um, network connections will have some level of physical latency that we can't control, and a great variety of software-related uh, latencies that we can control. One particular thing to note is that it's impossible to react to any information you have until you have that information. This means that anything that happens in a sequence, so reacting to things, will have its performance dominated by latency and not by throughput. So as far as HTTP is concerned, statistics for a single request are not particularly interesting. If you're fetching an interesting web page, you might have images embedded in that. You very likely have images embedded in that. Um, you might have a linked CSS file for your style sheet. Your CSS files might in turn link to font files. You might have JavaScript files that fire off HTTP requests for other things entirely. So how you make multiple requests of a service is about the most interesting thing that we as developers can fix about our apps. So another useful number that you might be interested in is the number 296.75. Um, the HTTP benchmarks we're doing in this talk all talk to a service called HTTP2bin, which is an HTTP benchmarking server that's uh, run by Corey Benfield. Uh, Traceroute tells me that this service is on a DigitalOcean server hosted in New York, and that's about as far away from Hobart as you can get via the internet. So it takes about 0.3 of a second to get anything to HTTP2bin.org and get stuff back from it. Um, if I were doing this over a mobile network like LTE, I might end up adding an extra 30 to 50 milliseconds on top of that. Or if I were using a really old 2G network, maybe an extra 300 milliseconds on top of that. Um, so I, being a mobile developer, wrote an Android app to, uh, to do some measurements, which we'll talk about later on. Um, if you want to go and take a look at it, there is an out-of-date version of it on GitHub under the title Bilious Spork, uh, Chris Jaren slash Bilious Spork. Um, so TCP, how does, um, that's quite important as far as, as far as HTTP is concerned because it's what underlies all of our HTTP connections. So TCP is a connection-based protocol that runs over IP. Um, being connection-based means it has a way of tracking communication between two specific services on those devices. Uh, it gives you other features like reliabilities, uh, reliability, order guarantees, and flow control. Um, the way you normally see TCP manifested is by this port number that appears on the end of a, uh, that can appear on the end of uh, addresses you type into things. HTTP normally listens on port 80. HTTPS listens on port 443 normally. So when you make a request over TCP, your own machine gets a return port uh, number to identify the connection that you initiated. The remote machine sends its messages addressed to your IP address and return port. And you tend to get about 64,000 of these return ports per IP address if you're a client. If you're a server, you might have fewer of those because you're listening to things on it. So there's only 4 billion IPv4 addresses. 
and there's more than 4 billion internet connected devices. Um, a solution to this is network address translation. So when your machine talks to its gateway on the internet, the gateway takes one of its own return TCP ports and translates between your machine's TCP, or your machine's IP and return port, uh, and the router's um, IP and return port. And this means that the machines on the broader internet only need to know about your own gateway. You need to only be able to talk to your own gateway, your own router, rather than your own your actual computing device. And so the trade-off here is that a big network only gets as many return ports as its gateway has. The more devices you have between a NAT device, behind a NAT device, the fewer return ports you have. Uh, 20 machines behind a NAT means that you only get 2K return connections, and 100 machines means you only get about 600 return connections per device. This is interesting uh, as a mobile developer because most cell networks uh, run behind network address translation. So if you're on a mobile network, you are most likely sharing a public IP address with a bunch of other devices. Um, when I did the original version of this talk, I found it was very difficult to exhaust the NAT on my cell network, though I did try. I got a whole bunch of devices and got all of them to attempt to uh, connect, and I still, couldn't, um, I still couldn't exhaust my cell tower. Uh, but it's an interesting theoretical possibility to consider and will happen in peak hour on trains and stuff like that. The reason why I dwell on TCP is because TCP is a huge source of latency that we can't really control if we're dealing with, H, uh, if we're dealing with HTTP, um, especially above uh, raw network performance. A lot of this comes back to doing a three-way handshake whenever you initiate a connection. So before you can send anything at all, you need to ask the thing on the other end um, to synchronize with you. The network, uh, the thing on the other end will send a thing back saying, hey, yes, I know that you want to synchronize with me and I've seen that. And you say, hey, yes, I've seen the fact that you know that I want to synchronize with you and then you can go and send stuff. And that takes quite a large amount of time. And so what that means is that TCP uh, is at its most efficient if you keep a connection open once you have it. Um, this allows for a thing called TCP flow control to kick in, which also allow, which means that uh, TCP can figure out uh, how to best use your, your network connection. Uh, but it only really does this if you keep connections open for a long time. Um, so in my benchmarking app, I made a thing that asks for one kilobyte, uh, two kilobytes, four kilobytes, et cetera, up to 96. And what you discover with this is that the less stuff you ask to come back, the slower your connections are in terms of total throughput. So I was only really able to saturate my connection here once I started asking for about 100K. So that's the only benchmark I'm going to look at which looks at a single request um, because TCP tends to take care of making your connection run fast if you request something big. Um, the behavior of your underlying protocols uh, affect performance as requests become more frequent the more things you request at once. So let's start with HTTP 1, which is the first version of HTTP that was standardized. So the first full version of it did two things that we're going to dwell on during this talk. The first is that the protocol is plain text, and the second is that it's a one-shot protocol. And by that, I mean one request could be made per connection. So let's take a look at these two things in detail. The first thing that we care about is that it's plain text. Um, so that basically means you can actually type out an HTTP request over a terminal if you're, um, that's meant to be a video. Mm, that's unfortunate. Where is my mouse? Did it work? Yeah, so you can type out your HTTP requests uh, over a uh, out over a terminal. Uh, here I'm opening a raw TCP socket to example.com. I'm typing out a simple get request um, for a document and we get back the HT, uh, HTML document that we asked for. And then the connection closes. Uh, let's watch that again, just to, to see that again. So once I get the thing with HTTP 1, uh, you can see the connection is closed by the server at the other end. Um, so being a plain text protocol, you can type out the stuff in your terminal. Um, and my notes are now broken. This is really exciting. 
There will be a brief pause while I make my presentation software work again. No. The, uh, the new world order of things working in browsers and talking over networks. It's uh, not quite a, yes, exactly. Um, things apparently don't remain synchronized. Right, so in that video we saw some HTML coming back from, um, from the server. Up the top of the screen, there's some stuff that we missed. We get a bunch of headers sent back as well, if you care about that. Um, so um, one shot HTTP is bad. I was meant to have a graph here. What has happened to my notes? Everything is breaking. Uh, that's unfortunate. Um, so why was HTTP designed like this? So HTTP 1 is slow. It doesn't use your network terribly efficiently. Um, but it was designed like this for a reason. And that was basically the early web browsers were plain text. Um, people would read web pages uh, with their eyes, and only when they want to follow a hyperlink would the browser need to go off and make another request. Um, so humans have high latency. For fuck's sake, excuse me. Um, so what changed with HTTP um, as browsers started getting more advanced. Um, pictures. When people get the sudden urge to look at their cat pictures, uh, people want to be validated immediately. So when people want their cat pictures, they're not particularly interested in seeing extra TCP negotiations uh, connected. Um, so the way this was fixed was with a thing called Keep Alives. Um, these are exactly what they say on the tin. Your connection is kept open once the response finishes. So let's see that in action. Great, my videos are in fact working this time. Let's hope that my notes stay working as well. This will be really exciting. I, uh, I, really, uh, I really like it when software works. So keep alive mean that the connection to the server is kept open after each response finishes. It's up to the client to terminate the connection once it has nothing else to request. So you can see here that I'm making three requests from example.com uh, without opening a new connection each time. We need to close the connection ourselves uh, once that's finished. And so what that means is, um, is that you don't need to renegotiate a connection on every single request. It's great you save that three-way handshake sequence. Um, and TCP is really good at learning to optimize the use of your connection to reduce latency and stuff. A problem is that it takes a while for it to do that, and a one-shot request will never get a chance to do that. Um, so here's a graph. Um, to generate it, I fired off 100 requests to HTTP bin's bytes endpoint, and I said I want, um, I want no bytes to come back with each response. And I fired these off in sequence. So after each request finished, I fired off another one. Uh, and across 100 requests, needing to reconnect via TCP every single time adds 31 seconds to the whole process. Um, that's about 310 milliseconds of latency per request, or basically our ping time. So, um, The RFC for HTTP 1.1 stipulates only two connections per server. Um, browsers tend not to obey that. Um, by default, Chrome only allows six connections to be made uh, per host name. Um, so doing multiple requests at once is one way to fix this, with H to make HTTP work faster. Um, you can change the setting for the number of hosts you, connect, you can connect to in Chrome. You can change it in Firefox if you want to. Um, it's still not particularly good uh, because having multiple requests open at once doesn't really help with latency too much. So we're going to look at a demo from the Golang uh, HTTP2 project to see why this is the case. So what you're going to see is 180 uh, individual images um, in a, uh, being downloaded via HTTP. Um, and it will make up an image that looks something like this at the end. Um, so this is on an 18 megabit uh, internet connection. 
loading this image, it's not particularly big. It should really be instant. Most of the delay is spent waiting for images to finish sending so that they can reuse the connections that it's left open. The other thing is that the images tend to load in a haphazard order. Um, you can't rely on things to come back in the order that you want to. So if you're writing a mobile application and you want to get more things firing off concurrently, it's easy enough to do that in code. You can change the number of requests your own apps fire off concurrently. If you're a developer working on the web, you can't really go off and change a user's concurrent request um, setting uh, without telling them to and confusing them. The good news is that most browsers have a higher global connection limit than a per host name limit. So you see stupid stuff like this done where people ask for uh, some of their images to come on one server with one host name and ask for other images to come off another server with another host name, which will get you more connections. Uh, the browser scope project tells me that at the moment, recent versions of Chrome have six um, concurrent connections per host name and 10 globally. And the mobile version of Chrome will let you do six per host name and seven uh, in total. The trade-offs here is that um, the more connections you make, the more things you can download at once, so the more images you can have appearing. And the fewer host names you have, the more things you can keep alive and you, the fewer TCP connections you need to negotiate, potentially through your, your NAT router. Uh, so who's seen something like this? Uh, who knows what's going on here? Uh, well, in fact, um, what we have here is a whole bunch of images on one page and a CSS file and a CSS file which embeds a font. And they're all coming off the same, coming off the same host name. And um, basically, we need to wait until the CSS is downloaded and all the embedded images are downloaded before it realizes that it can go and download a font because the font is enqueued and therefore you can't read any of the text because the font that renders all your stuff is two levels of requests further down. Um, so you need to have lots of connections to, to make HTTP work well, and that means that you need to do TCP quite badly to, uh, to do HTTP 1. So that's fun. Um, the other thing I said about HTTP is that it's insecure. So that's unfortunate because everything can be seen and easily read by somebody eavesdropping on your connection. Um, so you can have HTTPS, which is HTTP 1 over a secured TCP connection. And the difference here is that it takes even longer to connect uh, via TCP uh, at the startup of your connection. So once again, we're firing off 100 requests for zero byte responses, and this time we're adding HTTPS in. Uh, on the left in blue, we have the one um, with keep alive, uh, without keep alives. The one we have in red in the middle is with keep alives uh, with HTTPS, and the one on the right is our original one. So connecting via SSL for every single request results in a four times slowdown because we need to reconnect every single time. That slowdown is even faster, uh, is even more substantial uh, if you're using a mobile network. But the actual act of firing off a request once you have an SSL connection open uh, is only negligibly slower than TCP. Uh, but transmission is still much slower as, uh, than, than your raw HTTP. So as a mobile developer, uh, I've been on projects back when SSL was in fact a thing, um, and they've decided not to use a, uh, SSL for transporting its API. Um, and if you're not dealing with particularly sensitive communication, um, certainly back when mobile devices were new and batteries were not particularly good, keeping a, um, a TCP connection open for a long amount of time while you're on a mobile network would cause your batteries to drain. And having that extra connection negotiation time uh, made things unbearably, uh, unbearably slow if you didn't keep a connection open. Uh, that's less of an issue these days. Um, which is why Apple have decided that HTTPS is compulsory. Uh, so they're in the process of deprecating non-secure HTTP. And so from iOS 9, which came out what, three months ago now, and the most recent version of Mac OS, uh, if you're going to distribute something via the App Store, you need to say 
uh, you either need to only connect via HTTPS or you need to declare what host names you're going to connect to via unsecure HTTP uh, or say that you're going to allow connections to arbitrary unsecure HTTP hosts. Um, it seems likely to me that SSL is going to be compulsory for iOS and, and OS X stuff in the near future, uh, but certainly not the case now, but it is a degraded user experience if you're doing unsecure HTTP in the mobile world at the moment. I suspect Android will probably follow suit as well. So why isn't everybody doing HTTPS at the moment? Um, HTTPS is kind of a protection racket. You need to pay a certificate authority a lot of money to, um, to get a certificate. That makes it hard to use, so most people don't bother. Um, Let's Encrypt is a thing now, uh, which is a, yes. Um, I hear people are getting beta invites right now. I don't have one, so I still can't do the demo, uh, which I've wanted to do both times I proposed this talk. I proposed it back when it was going to be released in August. Um, that didn't happen. Um, but basically, Let's Encrypt is a free, HTTP, uh, a free SSL certificate authority. It's backed by the Electronic Foundier, uh, Frontier Foundation uh, and Akamai and Mozilla, amongst others. Um, the root cert for it is trusted by all browsers, at the mo all the major browsers at the moment. So once it is, um, once it is available, it will work for anything you want to use it for. And there'll be no good reason not to offer HTTPS on your own uh, services because you can get good certs for free. And hopefully that protection racket will no longer be a thing, which is really, really exciting. So the final thing I want to discuss today is the new hotness in HTTP called HTTP version 2. Uh, this is designed to work better with this, um, with the way the web works at the moment. So it's still basically the same protocol in terms of the semantics of it. Um, you send requests, you get responses. Um, and if you're writing a client or a server that talks HTTP, um, and talks HTTP 1 correctly, you can just upgrade your libraries and everything should just work, more or less. Uh, the main difference with it is that I can't do that cool demo where I type out stuff out of the terminal because it's a binary-based protocol instead of being plain text. And most browsers are disabling uh, HTTP 2 in non-secure circumstances. Um, so, but that, it's fine because there's no debugging benefit to being able to read the stuff that comes off your sockets because you can't read it because it's binary. Um, there is a Wireshark suite for debugging it if you want to do that. But the really interesting thing about it is that it is possible to have multiple requests and responses being returned down the same connection. This means it's possible to queue up multiple requests on the same connection and have the requests get sent down as soon as there's capacity. So let's see that in action. Um, so up the top, we have the HTTP 1 version of the tiles demo that I had beforehand. And down the bottom, we have the same thing running on HTTP 2. Um, as you can see, it's a whole lot faster. Um, the bottom one loads like five or six times before the top one finishes loading. So why is that the case? So once we download the HTML page that embeds all these tiles, uh, we can fire off every single request that we need to make um, in order to download those tiles at once down the same connection. And then the server at the other end is able to schedule sending the images back um, as it, in the most optimal fashion. So it's possible to queue up every single request for every single image down the same connection, and things will come back and it will be much faster. Questions at the end. Um, so this multiplexing thing is great. There's performance benefits that you can see in that particular visual demo. The first being that servers can prioritize which responses get sent down first. So if you have, say, embedded fonts, for example, um, and you make a request for embedded fonts, well, the server can say, oh, this needs to go down first so you can read the text. And there's no need to negotiate extra, extra TCP sockets in order to achieve concurrency. It's one connection, and then you can do as much stuff as you like at once which is great, but there's even more stuff. Um, audience participation, this is a fully, flu uh, fully formed HTML page. Uh, how many requests do you need to make in order to send down everything? 
People reckon three. Three seems like a completely reasonable answer. There is, in fact, no trick to this. Uh, you need to request the HTML page itself, and you need to download both of the images. Um, but we were able to infer that by looking at the HTML page. Um, with HTTP 1, you need to download the page before you can figure out that there are images that need to be downloaded. HTTP 2 has a thing called server push. And server push allows the server to start sending responses for things that haven't yet been requested, such, that, such as, for example, images that are embedded in a page that you've requested. Uh, so this means there's no round trip delay for requesting things that are definitely going to come down um, as you request them. And the demo of that is, um, <laughs> so the first one is our HTTP2 um, request response behavior one. It's pretty quick, um, but it still needs to wait for the HTML to come down before it can go and request all the images. The bottom one uses server push, and that allows the server to send down responses for all of the images that it's going to request before the uh, client, my browser, has gone and read the HTML. Um, that's because it's obvious that those images are going to come down with that HT HTML page, so it sends them both. So HTTP2 is fun because everything you know about making HTTP1 work faster is wrong. You only need to have one connection open. You only need to have one domain name. You can hold connections open, and things will get better. And it's great. You get flow control. And if you do it correctly, uh, it will max out your connection. You'll get the best throughput you can achieve uh, for your connection. Um, when I did this uh, talk a couple of months ago, I, it was at an Apple conference, and Apple's browsers were the only places where you couldn't use HTTP2, which was uh, fantastic for that audience. That has changed in the last two months. The latest version of every major web browser at the moment supports it, um, with the exception of Opera, um, Opera Mini, rather. And I don't think anybody uses Opera Mini for anything useful these days. Um, so it's great. Uh, go and make your stuff talk HTTP2, because your things will get faster without you needing to do anything. Uh, so this, I'm sure you'll agree, has been the worst episode of Sesame Street ever. Um, so you should really, when you are developing things, come up with some at least base level of understanding of what your stuff is doing when it's talking to a network. Um, Figure out whether or not network performance is actually a bottleneck for you, or whether or not you're just using your protocol in the wrong way. A um, bunch of re uh, resources I've used in this. Kenneth Wright's developed the original version of HTTP bin. The HTTP2 version of that that I used uh, for, my, um, for the demo app I wrote uh, is, was written by Corey Benfield, and that code is available on my GitHub somewhere. Um, I will now attempt to answer questions that people have uh, rather than watching stuff uh, break uh, in my presentation software. <laughs> so we do in indeed have some time for questions. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for your talk. Thank you. Uh, you said that we should use SSL for everything now. Do we need an IPv4 address for every little tin pot website on our server to do that? Um, so I'll correct you first. I didn't say you should use it for everything because it, SSL slows down download performance uh, quite substantially um, on Android in particular, on mobile devices. Uh, might not be the case on, on uh, bigger machines. Um, with my understanding is that Let's Encrypt will let you have a whole, well, will we'll, we'll let you make free SSL certs. Um, it shouldn't hurt to have SSL certs with multiple host names, given that they're free now. You don't have to pay extra for, um, for getting a cert that does that from a, uh, a ripoff certificate authority. But So that answers your question. It's really no. So you're saying get one SSL cert that has multiple host names, domain yeah. names in it? Yeah. OK. Thank you. Sorry? 
Yeah. yeah. So SNI, we're just mm -hmm. talking about over here for the video, um, that would allow you to have multiple different hosts on the one IP address with SSL. So I'll go here first and then I'll work. Yeah. I uh, just had a uh, thought with uh, HTTP2 and the server push. Um, yes. Can the client request that be turn, turned off? Like, So not it can't request that you can turn it off, but what you can, um, what you can do is you know, HTTP has really strong caching semantics, which I didn't talk about today because that's an entirely different topic and other people know more things about caching than I know. Um, but you need to be able to uniquely identify responses that come back from HTTP requests to make caching work. Um, what that means is um, when responses get sent down by server push, uh, it will send down cache tags for, um, for the things that it's sending down even before you send the request off. You can tell the server once stuff starts getting sent down to stop sending it. So you might get the headers for a response that it's sending down. You'll see the cache tag. It matches something that's in your cache. You can tell it to stop. Um, you might get a bit of stuff sent down, but you won't get a lot of stuff sent down. Hello? Sorry. Um, two questions about server push. One, is that automatic? Does yes. the server look at the HTML and decide, oh, two images here, better send them? Or uh, does it have to be configured at the server level? Uh, that's an implementation detail that your server needs to take care of. Okay. Um, but it is a thing that can be done trivially for HTML. Yes. Um, um, I'm guessing if you're, once major web frameworks start talking this properly, you'll have ways to push things down with responses you send out. And the second does, question... Has, does anybody have an experience with a framework that does that at the moment? Because I certainly don't know if any exist. Uh, no? Okay. <clears throat> so the second question was... Um, how does uh, server push conflict with caching? Uh, I've just answered that question. So um, it will start sending stuff down uh, the moment it um, the moment it's it knows it can start sending stuff down. But it will send back the entire response header set for a um, for a thing that's going to push. That will include cache tags. And it is possible for the, um, for the client to send a stop uh, message back to the server for a given response. So you might get the first few bytes of a, of a thing before you realize that you've already got this in your case and you can tell it to stop. But you might download a tiny bit of a large response uh, in, in a few cases. But... Um, in the case where you're downloading all new stuff, it will always be much faster. Jack. Thank you. Um, when we take the HTTP to push example away from HTML documents and to other resources that we request, such as JSON or um, right. a API payloads, how do you see this impacting application and service design over the next few years as we start to um, push potentially unwanted data sets at clients? So, hmm. that's, so, what I think, not answering your question specifically, but I think things like, um, for example, Twitter's API has a thing called expand entities in your, uh, when you ask for a tweet feed, which allows you to ask for you know, it, you can say either just send me the raw tweets or send me the tweets and the profile data for every single user that is referenced, expand out every single link and its metadata uh, for this response, uh, which is done entirely to reduce HTTP requests made on, um, uh, made for getting a, a series of tweets. And it does make things faster if you need all of that stuff. Um, If you're dealing with a, uh, if you're making something that doesn't need all that stuff, you will get a whole bunch of, it might change to say request entities goes away and it just pushes down everything that would have been sent as an entity. It's just a matter of filtering out responses that you don't care about. Um, that might change thing, that might change how you design things, it might not. Uh, 
Uh, given that uh, HTTP2 is going to be a binary protocol and yes. all previous versions of HTTP were plain text, mm -hmm. how is HTTP2 going to handle uh, protocol version negotiation between the client and server? Um, an HTTP2 message will start looking like an HTTP2 message, an HTTP1 message will start looking like an HTTP1 message. That, does that mean we'll, we'll lose backwards compatibility? No, both servers can speak both. Uh, this will probably be the last question and then yep. we'll have to wrap up. Uh, so somewhat related to the previous question, um, how does the browser decide whether to send an HTTP2 request or an HTTP 1.1 request to a server as its initial communication? Uh, that's a detail I'm not entirely familiar with. Okay. So Julian tells me that they uh, that they send some extra information down in SSL negotiation, uh, which is clever because most HTTP, uh, because all browsers only support HTTP two over SSL. All right, thanks for all the great questions. And Chris, thank you very much for the thank talk. You. It's much appreciated. Mm. It's a gift from the conference organizers. Mm. <laughs>